On the Hikaria Apache Reservation in northern New Mexico sits the small community of Dulce. Since the late 1970s, it's become a landmark in the strange world of UFO conspiracies, up there with the likes of Area 51 thanks to horrifying tales of alien bases underneath Mount Archulator. But the real story of Dulce has its roots in the cattle mutilation wave of the mid to late 1970s. People tell me Dulce wasn't always a center for supernatural activity, but then sometime in the 70s, things changed. That's when cows started turning up mutilated. We had never really experienced anything out of the ordinary and on that June 13th, I can remember it very, very vividly. It was a Sunday morning. My father and I and my brother and my sister went out to the ranch to check on the cattle. And we came up on this cow that had died. And, uh, we had never experienced a cattle mutilation. We had heard about them happening in southern Colorado, but had never really experienced one. It was these mutilations that caught the attention of UFO researcher Paul Benowitz. I had been working with a highway patrolman up north. Uh, that initially happened, uh, I believe, as I recall, in June of 76. And a subsequent Air Force Office of Special Investigations disinformation campaign would help secure Dulcie's place in UFO. UFO history. This video will focus on how the myths around Dulcie began in the mid-70s, so if you're looking to hear about Phil Schneider's missing fingers and an underground alien war, then you might be disappointed. But to really understand those stories, you need to know how it all began with one terrified phone call on June 13th, 1976. This series is brought to you by viewer support on Patreon. You can sign up for as little as £1 a month, which gives you early access to videos and helps to fund the research and creation of these documentaries. Go to the link in the description or the pinned comment and sign up today. For a cattle rancher, finding a dead animal isn't exactly out of the ordinary. But what Manuel Gomez found in June 1976 was unlike anything he'd ever seen on his property. On the phone to Officer Gabe Valdez that evening, he relayed the story of stumbling upon one of his cows laying dead in the pasture. But what took him by surprise was the bizarre and seemingly calculated way in which it had been killed. The Gomez family had homesteaded the Dulce area since the mid-1800s, and according to Manuel's son Edmund, it was the first First mutilation that they'd ever encountered on their property. It was a Sunday morning. Uh, my father and I and my brother and my sister went out uh, to the ranch to uh, check on the cattle, and uh, we came up on this uh, on this cow that had died. And of course, you know, the first thing you do is uh, you come up to them and check to see what uh, what caused the death, and check the ear tags, check uh, check the mouth, see how old. Uh, the animal is and try to find out what uh, what actually is going on. At 5 a.m. the next morning, Officer Valdez and Paul Riley of the New Mexico Cattle Sanitary Board began to investigate. The scene that awaited them was gruesome. The cow lay dead on its right side and parts of its body had been removed with what seemed to be a sharp object. The cuts were precise, not a spot of blood could be seen on the white hide and the only other injury was what appeared to be a puncture wound on the brisket. Alongside the grizzly carcass, there were more strange discoveries. On the nearby hill, they found three depressions in the ground, about six feet apart, followed by a series of small suction cup-like imprints that led to the mutilated animal. Tracks of the cow showed where she'd struggled and fallen. The small tripod tracks were all around the cow. Other evidence showed that the grass around the tripods, as they followed the cow, had been scorched. Left behind in the indentations was a yellow oily substance that nobody could seem to identify. It was all very bizarre to say the least. When Manuel Gomez had called the night before, he'd made it a point to note that the dead cow's ears were still intact. But now, just a few hours later, the left ear appeared to have been cut off. And if all that wasn't odd enough, he also found circular impressions over the top of his tire tracks from the day before. Had he interrupted the mutilators the first time round? And did they come back that night to finish the job and take the cow's ear? It might sound a little far-fetched, and some might say that a missing ear could be the result of predators, but that was the conclusion that the three men came to as they inspected the mutilated animal. We found that some type of aircraft landed and scorched the grass. We say aircraft, but we don't know what it could be. Something landed there. 
The case made the local news, hitting the headlines of the Santa Fe, New Mexican, just a few days after the carcass was found. The story attracted the attention of a local radio DJ named Zane Blaney, who called Valdez to find out more about the strange mutilation. Determined to crack the case, Valdez asked Blaney whether he knew anyone that could come and test the site for radiation, and it just so happened that Blaney was friends with Dr. Howard Burgess. He was a retired scientist who had worked at Sandia National Laboratories up until the mid-1970s, headquartered at Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque. While he was there, he'd worked on the team that had built the first hydrogen bomb, and back in the 50s, he claimed to have seen UFOs at the base too. He also seemed to take a remarkable interest in topics like extrasensory perception, holding a series of lectures on the phenomena in the Albuquerque area. So I do call on Mr. Burgess because he, he has a lot of knowledge in the field of science that is uh, very helpful to me in conducting my investigation. Burgess conducted radiation testing on the mutilated carcass and allegedly found levels twice as high as the regular background amount. However, it's important to note here that much like the case of Snippy the horse, it's disputed as to whether Burgess took a background radiation reading at the scene. If he didn't, the results are pretty much pointless. But that didn't stop anyone from hypothesizing that perhaps a nuclear-powered aircraft had been responsible for the mutilation. On the very same day as the radiation reading, the mutilators appeared to strike again. According to a local news report, the second dead cow was found around half a mile from the first. The Hikaria Apache Tribal Police claimed that it had been dead for around three weeks, and there appeared to be some commonalities between the two mutilations, most notably missing organs that looked as if they'd been severed by a sharp object. But I think it's important to highlight here that the animal had been dead for a long time. As far as I know, no tissue samples were taken, so it's hard to ascertain the cause of death and whether or not organs had actually been meticulously cut or just ripped by predators. When I spoke to cattle mutilation investigator Christopher O'Brien, he stressed the importance of one specific factor to look for in an unexplained livestock death. And the first thing I do is I look for cut hair follicles. Um, nothing in nature is going to cut hair in a straight line. If I find that particular thing, then that is a pretty much a slam dunk indication that somebody with you know intelligence and with a tool was able to make the incision, cut cut the hide, cut down to through the flesh, and in doing so they cut the hair follicles. Animals, when they tear, and scavengers, let's say, tear up a, uh, a carcass out in the West, um, they, they tear between the hair follicles. They don't actually cut the hair. I don't know how many of these Johnny-come-lately investigators that have been tramping around claiming to be cattle mule investigations, investigators, I've been trying to get them to, to look for this, but not one of them I've ever heard mention cut hair follicles and to me that's a litmus test if you find that somebody did that with prejudice and with it with intelligence and with tools to uh to create those wounds i'm not sure whether any of that was taken into consideration especially considering that these mutilations occurred right at the very beginning of the phenomena but gabe valdez did write a series of incident reports that are worthy of further scrutiny the incident report on the Gomez Ranch mutilation wasn't written up until the end of 1976, in which Gabe Valdez claimed that he had investigated approximately 23 cattle mutilations in the state of New Mexico within the last 16 months that all seemed to carry the same patterns. The target always appeared to be the animal's lymphatic system, and he wrote that one of the mutilated cows had a high dosage of atropine, a tranquilizing drug, in its blood system. But here's the thing, atropine isn't actually a tranquilizer. It's a tropane alkaloid that can be found in a toxic plant called a tropa belladonna. So it's quite possible that the cow Gabe Valdez was referring to had eaten a toxic plant and died from it. The details in the incident report are incredibly vague and they're written months after the fact. There's limited information on the mutilations that Valdez was referring to and it does make it incredibly difficult to figure out exactly what the timeline was. The mid-1970s saw 
saw a huge wave of mutilations across the American Southwest, often accompanied by helicopter sightings and mysterious lights in the sky. Between October and December 1975, northern New Mexico was hit hard with at least 16 cases, and there were all manner of explanations for what was causing them, from simple predators and neglect, to environmental testing and psychological warfare, and, naturally, aliens. Extraterrestrials had been shouldering some of the blame for the phenomena ever since the infamous case of Snippy the Horse in the San Luis Valley. She was the first mutilated animal to be connected to flying saucers, and I covered her in the first part of this series. If you haven't watched it, I highly recommend you do, because there's a lot of overlap and lots of connecting rabbit holes. And Dulce is just over the western border of the San Luis Valley. It's very close. Yeah. As the crow flies, it's about 40 miles away. So, you know, we're, we're talking about a, a, a region that um, has reoccurring reports uh, that are reminiscent from one one side of the, the mountains to the other. There were so many cattle mutilations plaguing the state of Colorado that the Bureau of Investigation eventually got involved in 1975. They brought in the State University's College of Veterinary Medicine, and out of the 19 cases examined there, almost half were determined to be willfully mutilated with a sharp instrument. The governor of Colorado, Richard Lamb, would go on to say that the mutilations were one of the greatest outrages in the history of the Western cattle industry. These unexplained livestock deaths dominated the newspapers, and the Gomez family were well aware of the phenomena too. Oh, I knew all about the mutilations before we ever had one here. I read about them and heard about them in Colorado and other places. In his incident report, Valdez writes that he'd been working with a sheriff named Tex Graves from Logan County, Colorado. Apparently, Graves had been unable to get cooperation from Colorado State University, and that's one of the reasons why Gabe stepped in to help. It was Sheriff Tex Graves who told me, Linda, I'll save you some time. The perpetrators are creatures from outer space. Perhaps that's why Tex Graves couldn't get anyone at the university to talk to him. According to Linda Moulton Howe, he was a hardcore UFO believer. And it does make you wonder whether or not his strong belief may have rubbed off on other investigators. Valdez ended his incident report on a seemingly scientific note by saying, Investigation is narrowed down to these theories which involve experimental use of B12 and the testing of the lymph node system. During this investigation, an intensive study had been made of what is involved in germ warfare testing and the possible correlation of these three factors. Germ warfare testing, use of vitamin B12, and test of the lymph node system. Investigation is continuing on this case. In the book Mute Evidence, writers Daniel Kagan and Ian Summers have an interesting take on the relationship between Gabe Valdez and Howard Burgess, writing that when Burgess, seemingly educated, seemingly versed in the sciences, implying that he held all kinds of top secret clearances from Sandia Laboratories, first showed up in Dulce in 1976, lugging his Geiger counter, Valdez figured he had finally met an expert. They point out that the source for so much of the information included in the incident reports comes from Burgess, that Valdez leaned on him heavily for scientific explanations, and in turn, Burgess leaned on Valdez's official incident reports to lend credibility to some of his theories. Now, I'm not in the business of creating my own conspiracies, but some of these connections are definitely worthy of further scrutiny, and the biggest corkboard you've ever seen in your life. You've got Howard Burgess, a man who had very recently retired from his job at Sandia, which was based at Kirtland Air Force Base, taking a strong interest in unexplained livestock deaths in the Dulce area, which would later capture the attention of two prominent figures that were targeted by a complex UFO psychological operation based out of Kirtland Air Force Base. The consequences of that disinformation campaign can be seen all over the field of ufology and pop culture in general. Let's just say The X-Files would be an entirely different show if it hadn't have happened. Have you ever seen a UFO in these parts? At 7.30am on the 24th of April, Gabe Valdez received another frantic phone call 
from Manuel Gomez. He'd last seen his 11-month-old bull the evening prior. It was seemingly happy and healthy, but by 3 a.m., it was dead. 1977 had been a seemingly quiet year in Dulcie on the cattle mutilation front, but now it seemed like the mutilators had struck again, and this time, things were going to get a lot stranger. The cuts on the animal appeared to be surgical, and there was light pink blood in its nose, but that wasn't all. There were visible bruises on the brisket area of the animal, almost looking as if some kind of strap had been used to lift and lower it. Valdez found what he claimed to be four-inch round footprints, and he even went so far is to write in his report that the footprints led to the animal and back 100 feet, where they apparently returned to a hovering aircraft. But how did Valdez know that an aircraft was there? In his book Dulcie Base, his son Greg writes that it had become common to see strange lights and unmarked helicopters on Mundo Ridge, directly behind the Gomez property. A visitor at the Gomez Ranch claimed to have heard a low-flying aircraft the night of the mutilation, but there wasn't any definitive proof that one was there. Valdez still included it in his report, and went as far as to theorise that the animals were being picked up by the mysterious aircraft, mutilated somewhere else, only to be dumped back where they were originally taken. Valdez and Burgess took samples of the bull's heart and liver, and Valdez made it a point to note that the organs had the consistency of peanut butter and were white and mushy. Sounds incredibly appetising. They sent samples of the heart and some of the bones to Dr. Donald Peterson at Los Alamos Laboratories, and samples of the heart and liver to a private laboratory called Schoenfield Labs, which was run by Robert Schoenfield, a friend of Howard Burgess. Schoenfield claimed to have discovered that the liver contained four times the amount of phosphorus, zinc and potassium, and was also remarkably lacking in copper. The interesting thing that we found, and once again, we don't know what it means, but on the control sample of good liver, we found it had copper, which is a normal thing found in living tissues. But in the mutilated animal, there is absolutely no copper in the tissue, and the liver gives the impression that it may have had a very heavy dose of microwave radiation. At Los Alamos, however, the findings were less than spectacular and Dr. Donald Peterson would claim that it was difficult to draw definitive answers because the samples had been frozen, a charge that Valdez emphatically denied. I don't even think they tested those samples. Howard Burgess says they couldn't have. They had the report out in less than 36 hours and it takes longer than that to run a culture. We didn't freeze them, we did everything right. They made us look like fools. Just four days later, another bull was found dead on the Gomez Ranch, although it had actually been dead for around five days and was badly decomposed. The incident report said that no tracks were detectable and no samples of tissues were taken due to the state of the carcass. The next mutilation took place at the beginning of May on the ranch of Raleigh Tafoya, the chief of the Hikari Apache Tribal Police, just over 20 miles away from Dulcie. Like the other cases, the organs appeared to have been removed with surgical precision, and light pink blood was found around the nose. The animal's left front and rear legs had been broken, and Valdez wrote in his report that this indicates that the animals were lifted by their extremities. Those four-inch diameter round marks made an appearance again, this time around 600 yards from where the animal was found. Howard Vigil, a rancher in Dulcie, was to become the next target of the mutilators. On the 28th of May, he found two of his cows dead, and I probably don't need to tell you that the organs were missing, or that pink blood was found. We're starting to see a pattern here, right? Or at least I hope you are if you're paying attention. Both of the cows had their left front and rear legs broken too, and Valdez wrote that there was evidence of turbulence from aircraft apparent at the scene, although I'm not entirely sure what the evidence actually was. About two weeks later, poor Manuel Gomez was struck again. You won't be surprised if I tell you that the legs were broken that there was pink blood, and that there was missing organs. But I do think that we should go through this checklist in a little more detail. Firstly, the broken legs. According to an article by David Perkins, Valdez discovered the legs were broken by manoeuvring the left front and hind legs, and at one point even kicked the back of a mutilated animal to show that its back had been broken. These aren't exactly foolproof ways of proving broken
broken bones. Secondly, the pink blood. Howard Burgess would hypothesize that radiation was releasing copper from the animal's blood, resulting in a watery, slightly pink color being found. But this was disputed by scientists, one of which said that Burgess obviously doesn't know a whole lot about the metabolism of trace elements in animals. As for the missing organs, it's important to remember that predators will eat tongues, udders, and other unsavory parts of a deceased animal. When one of these cows die, their bodies become bloated and certain parts protrude. I think you know what parts I'm talking about. I don't need to spell it out for you. These become tasty treats for birds and coyotes. But I do want to be clear. I'm not trying to be a debunker and I'm not saying that this is a foolproof explanation for some of the missing organs. But I do think it's important to point out that the majority of so-called cow mutilations do have reasonable explanations. Even researchers like Christopher O'Brien will tell you that most of these mutilations can be explained and there's only a small percentage which defy any explanation at all. Out of the 200 cases that I investigated, I figure about 160 were equivocal. It could have been misidentified scavenger action. It could have been some mundane explanation besides somebody actually with intelligence and tools doing that to the animal. And that, that leaves about 20% or 40 cases. And out of those 40, I'd say eight to 10 defy any sort of explanation. So we're talking what, five, six, 7% are uh, high strange cases that can't be explained. Unlike other investigators who go the opposite direction, they say 160 cases are high strange and 40 are, are you know, equivocal. I'm more skeptical and, and a little more jaded now. I've tempered my enthusiasm with an amateur education in forensic science and I let my experts tell me what we're looking at here and uh, I don't uh, go out on a limb and make pronouncements. Valdez also claims to have found marks visible on the lower left rear leg of the animal and to him it was a sign that some sort of clamp had been used to hoist the cow into the air and ferry it away for mutilation. Again, it's hard to ascertain what the truth is because the evidence is an incident report and the marks on the leg could have been anything. But he did also note that one of the cow's horns had broken off into the ground, possibly on impact after being unceremoniously dumped from a hovering helicopter. Although they're disputed, I don't think that Valdez's theories about cows being taken were necessarily that out there. By 1978, it really did feel like unexplained livestock deaths were starting to ramp up. Poor old Manuel Gomez seemed to be pulling the short straw, a constant target of the mysterious mutilators. Could it be that someone or something was picking him specifically? And if so, how are they identifying the unlucky animals? On July 16th, Howard and Gabe decided to take matters into their own hands and try to get to the bottom of what the hell was going on at Manuel Gomez's ranch. The incident reports all seemed to point in one direction, up. And if the cows were being targeted from above, then it wouldn't be beyond the realms of possibility to assume that certain cattle were being marked in advance, making it easier for them to be spotted by hovering aircraft. They decided to test their theory under the cover of darkness, rounding up Gomez's herd through a cattle chute where they would then check the hide with an ultraviolet light. So we took uh, ultraviolet with some special filters and ran the cattle through it and what appears to be markings glowed under ultraviolet. It's invisible to the normal eye, but under ultraviolet it does glow. Then we removed the hair from the region that does glow, and we removed a control sample. We took these to the lab and had chemical checks run on them. It looked like Burgess and Valdez were right. The mutilators really were picking out cattle in advance, or were they? In the book Mute Evidence, the writers point to a September 1974 issue of Aviation Week and Space Technology, which discusses the use of laser-activated fluorescent dye being experimented with by the Navy for search and rescue operations at sea. Of course, 
that's a far cry from marking cattle for mutilation in northern New Mexico, but it does prove that the technology existed. On the other hand, veterinary pathologist Dr. John King was quick to point out that there are plenty of different materials, including dyes, grease, oil and glues, that are fluorescent. We don't notice them because we're not going around flashing a UV light everywhere. That stuff most likely got on their hides that way, by accident. It could even have come from the chute they ran the animals through when they conducted their test. Old Bob Scheinfield at Scheinfield Labs found that the levels of potassium in the hides that had been marked were 70 times higher than a control sample, but whatever it was, it was never identified. Later down the line, other chemists would look at these test results and say that they were within normal limits. But for Gabe Valdez and Howard Burgess, it was an incredibly important discovery. However, it wasn't until they found out about another incident that their theories started to take on an even stranger shape. To Taos, Pueblo, out in New On the 2nd of July, 130 miles from Dulce, and exactly two weeks before the UV experiment, members of three families in the small community of Taos witnessed a peculiar light in the sky. I had just gone to bed and suddenly the room lit up with a bright orange light. I thought maybe the neighbors were throwing firecrackers. I went to the window and opened it and I could hear a kind of cracking noise. The light was so bright I could see for some distance. At first I thought the neighbor's house was on fire, so I went to the other window. I saw this form, it wasn't a definite form, but it was roundish and about as big as two cars, maybe bigger. By then it wasn't orange anymore, it was sort of a grey color. It stayed for about two minutes. I rushed into another bedroom and opened the drapes and it took off to the north and disappeared in two seconds. Whatever the mysterious craft was, it hovered over a 500-gallon fuel tank and a pickup truck that belonged to Leroy Graham, leaving behind a thin layer of grey powder on the roof and windscreen. It was collected in a small jar, and once Howard Burgess got wind of the story, he made his way to Taos to see the material for himself. It was described as looking like paint chips, and he soon took the anomalous substance to, you guessed it, Schoenfield Labs, where Bob got to work with his analysis. Much like the hides of Manuel Gomez's herd, the chips contained high levels of potassium and magnesium, and Bob was quick to point out that this wouldn't occur naturally in the air, that it must have been moved by something or someone. The story of the Taos Flying Saucer got written up in a small booklet, by a local artist named Peter Wood, and it's incredibly difficult to find. However, it did get a mention in the Taos News, and it references a police officer's description of the craft as sophisticated and something unavailable to humans. Could this peculiar UFO sighting be linked to the mutilations that had been plaguing Dulce? It seemed like a distinct possibility, especially given the witness reports of orange lights over the Mundo Ridge. But believe it or not, Manuel Gomez was about to uncover something even more peculiar. Nineteen seventy eight appeared to be the year for high strangeness in northern New Mexico, and if you thought the UFO sighting in Taos was bizarre, you might want to strap in for this one. At some point that summer, it's alleged that a tombstone in the Gomez family cemetery began glowing at night. The cemetery in question sat directly behind the ranch house at the very beginning of Mundo Ridge, and this light was spotted by multiple people, including Hikaria Tribal Police and Gabe Valdez. The the first time Valdez noticed it, he thought that he'd caught the mutilators in the act, but when he got closer to the mysterious glow, he began to realise that it was coming directly from the tombstone itself. Did Manuel Gomez have a radioactive grave in his backyard? Was he being cursed? What the hell was going on? To get to the bottom of the mystery, Valdez decided to speak to the local power company, who agreed to turn off all of the lights in Dulce, so that he could determine whether the tombstone continued to glow. Annoying for the residents, they happened to cut the power during one of Muhammad Ali's championship boxing matches. You can imagine how well that went down. It was kind of all for nothing as well, because the tombstone just carried on emitting its eerie light. Valdez and the Gomez family eventually 
hypothesised that this tombstone was being used as a navigational marker for the aircraft that had been spotted flying over Dulcie and the Mundo Ridge. I wanted to see whether or not there was any precedent for glowing tombstones, and, lo and behold, there was. I found an article in the Albuquerque Tribune from 1971 that detailed glowing tombstones in a town called Lovington. Geologists had gotten to the bottom of the mystery, claiming that the stones contained a compound that was activated by daylight, causing it to glow in the dark. According to the book Mute Evidence, Howard Burgess had told the writers that the glow was actually a reflection from a utility light, and that Gabe Valdez had told him that when he turned off all of the lights in town, the tombstone had darkened too. Like so much of this, it's incredibly hard to know what to believe. Greg Valdez's book doesn't mention anything about his father claiming that the tombstone had darkened, so we've got a bunch of conflicting reports. But let's say that we entertain the notion of the tombstone as a navigational marker. Greg Valdez notes that Los Alamos Laboratories and Mount Archelator in Dulce are around 77 air miles apart, and that Mundo Ridge provides a straight line between the two locations. Say for a moment that Gabe's theory was right, that the cattle really were being picked up by some unknown entity and taken to a different location for experimentation and testing. Los Alamos would surely be one of the most obvious culprits. And if that's what was really happening, was it alien spacecraft snatching up all of those cows? Or something more earthly? In the second part of this video, we'll be diving further down the Dulce rabbit hole. From black helicopters to nuclear testing, psychological operations, and the sagebrush rebellion, and an Albuquerque conference on the cattle mutilation phenomena that may have put a target on one UFO researcher's back. If you like this video, then make sure to subscribe and consider supporting my Patreon. It's through viewer support that I can continue this research and continue making these documentaries. And with that said, I'll see you next time. Yeah.